Good day, watercolor class. You should have at this point already watched the videos on paper um, and brushes. And so this one is going to cover paints, palettes, and miscellaneous items that you will need for this class. So got a lot of stuff out here on my tabletop to talk about. <clears throat> First, let's talk about paints. Oh, about seven or eight years ago, I switched over completely to Grumbacher, not Grumbacher, I'm sorry, to Windsor Newton, Cotman paints. Uh, that is, uh, I've always wanted to try Windsor Newton. Uh, I've been painting with Grumbacher Academy paints, which is what we sell in the bookstore, and they're good paints. And I've been using those for over 40 years and just thought I would experiment some with um, Windsor Newton. It's a very old um, medium. It's been around a long time. Uh, so I bought a whole set of it. Uh, set me back financially a little bit because to buy all of the colors in the palette all at once it's a little pricey. So keep that in mind as you're buying your paints for this class. You may or may not want to go out and buy all the paints that are on the list that I gave you. On the supplies list, <clears throat> and hopefully by now you've looked at that list, you know that there are, the list is quite long, but there is an asterisk beside the colors that I considered the most important. Basically what you want are the primaries, the secondaries, a few tertiaries, <clears throat> and several options for neutrals. So uh, let's get away from the specific brand. And by the way, you don't really, you don't want to buy your watercolor paints at Walmart or any big box store that sells to the masses. You want to buy a name brand, a good quality watercolor pigment. You're going to be spending too much time uh, learning the the process uh, to waste your time and effort on paints that may fade uh, within years, a uh, few years possibly. Uh, certainly they're not going to be as archival. What happens with the really cheap paints is they put a lot of filler, uh, non-pigment stuff in the paint. So it just takes a lot more paint to get the same color punch that you'll get with a more expensive paint. So, uh, Grumbacher Academy are good, uh, Cotman's, or Windsor Newton's Cotman is a good color. <clears throat> so, we're going to put the paints aside. By the way, they come in small tubes. You can buy the cakes uh, of watercolor. Those are the watercolor sets where you they're in dried little cells or compartments. Those are fine, except you have a very limited number of colors at any one point. Uh, they're more useful for when you go out on the field and you don't want to be carrying uh, little squeeze bottles of pigment with you, although it's not that hard to carry them along. So, <clears throat> well, what do you put your paints in? To tell you the truth, you can use anything for a palette, uh, but you'll need a surface to squeeze your paint out of the tube into some sort of a well. For instance, here's these little trays, a bunch of little circle areas and a little mixing area in the middle. And I've had students go through the entire class using nothing but one of these. And I feel so sorry for them because it's such a handicap not having a large mixing surface to work in. So these are cheap, but if you put your colors out in something like this, you'll probably need more than one of these you're still going to need some large flat area to mix your colors and I'm, I've got this thing about <clears throat> about collecting non-absorbent white surfaces uh, for instance um, by the way I got permission from the airline in each of these cases uh, this is a Delta serving tray I do not recommend uh, that you sneak those off of an airplane but on international flights I guess they 
stewardesses thought I had invested enough money. And they said, yeah, that would be okay. Take one of those with you. Great surface because it has a border that keeps the water from flowing off onto the table or your lap. Uh, so it's a great surface to mix in. Uh, this is, hmm, tell you the truth, I don't remember. This was an airline tray. I don't recall. It's made in Wisconsin. Also a good tray. Uh, so any large flat surface like that is going to work. And if you're on a tight budget, just a piece of white foam core because it's a relatively non-absorbent surface. does need to be white, though. Uh, if you're trying to mix paints on a, on a colored surface or a gray surface or a black surface, because watercolor is transparent, you just you don't know what the color is until you put it on the paper. So you want to be mixing on a white palette. <clears throat> so, oh, by the way, these are also little airline food serving things. I keep a lot of these little white containers around when I need to mix up another little batch. Uh, so, well, if you want to buy, though, if you want to go ahead and get a good palette, I highly recommend this one. This is the John Pike palette. John Pike uh, is a pretty well-known American watercolorist. He's written books. Um, you can do a Google search for John Pike and see a lot of his work. <clears throat> and it's my understanding that he uh, prescribed or designed, told them, hey, this is what I need. This is a high-impact plastic. It's what good quality telephones are made out of, used to be made out of when we had telephones hooked to the wall. And <clears throat> so here's the palette itself. It has a large area separated from the, the wells by a little ridge so the wet area, the mixing area doesn't move over into the, the cells. That's really important so you need the paint either in a different device or uh, separated like this. The John Pike palette also comes in a larger size that has cells all the way around. That Those are nice. Uh, so there's a couple versions of them. You can buy these on sale sometimes uh, for 10 bucks, but I think the last time I checked they were about $20 for a palette. There's a lot of palettes out there, uh, but keep this in mind. Ideally you want cell areas separated with a ridge and dividers for the pigments and a large, at least one if not several mixing areas. That's what you need. The John Pike palette has a lid that also gives you another surface area to mix colors in and when you get ready to quit for the day you can put the lid on and walk away with it. <clears throat> I bought this one about 50 years ago. <clears throat> it's yellowed on me a little bit. And so, uh, by the way, this has Grumbacher paints in it, but any color mixing on this is going to be distorted just a little bit because, uh, because it has yellow. Uh, and I still use this palette a little bit now and then, uh, but my main palette now is this new one. So you need a palette, something to put your pigments in. So you're going to buy pigments, preferably in tubes. Uh, by the way, you buy them in tubes because if you're wanting to mix a large quantity of paint, you can squeeze out a fresh batch of it, uh, or a, spa a, a fresh uh, squirt of it, if you will. I don't know why that lid is wanting to come off. But... So you're painting, and it's going to, the first thing I do when I'm going to get in ready to paint is I, I open this up, and I dip into my water container, and I put a bunch of water in each one of the cells. And so they start to soften and soak. That way, when I start to paint, I don't have to work it as much with the brush in order to get the pigment, uh, the strength of pigment that I need. But if you need to mix a large quantity, you want to paint a sky on a big sheet of paper and you need a lot more, well then you just squirt out some more into the appropriate cell and mix your larger quantity. It 
doesn't take as long if it's already soft. Uh, but that just speeds it up a little bit. If you're always working from a cake, a dried cake, it's going to slow down your initial painting process just a bit. <clears throat> well, so we've talked about paper already in the other video, and we talked about um, brushes. I spent a quite a bit of time talking about brushes, so you want to watch those videos if you haven't yet. So, so we got paints, we've got paper, we've got brushes, so what else do you need? Well, there are some other things that you're going to want, uh, you're going to, want to have access to. <clears throat> so I'm just going to start, jump in and start talking about some of these. One of the, th keep in mind, with watercolor, the white of the paper is the only white you use. You're not going to use white pigment, so you're relying on the transparency of the watercolor. So the more water, the light, the more water with the pigment, and the water pigment ratio, the higher the water side of the ratio, the lighter the color, the more transparent it is, the more the white paper is going to show through. So you'll get lighter and lighter tints as you add more water. <coughs> But what if you want pure white? Well, then you need to block off some areas. You need to protect it. And you can protect areas with tape, uh, masking tape. Uh, I found Scotch Magic Tape. It's the translucent looking Scotch Magic Tape. Works really well for blocking off hard edges. Maybe a horizon, a straight horizon, or the edge of a roof of a building so the sky doesn't run down into it. And you can even cut the tape into, into shapes. Um, so that would be one way to preserve the color of the paper. Another one is with a liquid frisket. Uh, frisket is the generic term. Uh, Misket is a brand that the bookstore used to carry. They don't have it right now. They're carrying white mask. And uh, it, it is a water-soluble material that you can paint on your paper, let it dry completely. Don't ever paint it on wet paper, by the way. It'll soak in and you don't ever get it off. <clears throat> paint it on the dry paper, let it dry. And when you paint over that area, this protects the paper. After your watercolor is completely dry, just rub it off and you have these stark white areas to go back and paint into. Sometimes that's what you want. Sometimes not. Well, other ways to get white is to scratch out or erase. This is a little Faber or Faber Castell ink eraser. I discovered these in China. I've got quite a few of them. I can't find a store that sells them locally, uh, but I found uh, you can buy them online. I had one of our Chinese students buy me a whole slew of them <clears throat> a few years ago when she came back from China. Uh, they were very cheap over there. They're an ink eraser, so they've got a lot of grit. And you can literally erase the pigment from the surface, creating highlights. Uh, so I can create a soft highlight with this eraser. Uh, one of the tools you're going to need. Hang on a moment here. Another tool you will need is some kind of a knife. It can be a razor blade. Uh, run down to our mat cutting room and there's a can of extra mat cutting blades. Uh, but you can scratch highlights in. And it, it's one of the last things you want to do. You don't want to uh, start scratching your surface before you start painting because the paint's going to soak in and those will be darker areas. But as a last way to get highlights is you can pick them in, and I think snowflakes or whatever, or scratch them in. If you take a razor blade and scrape it flat, it'll straight scrape some of the surface and you'll get a softer highlight. So some kind of a exacto knife or razor blade, which we have plenty of around the building, would be good. <clears throat> One of the uh, techniques that artists use a lot, some do, I've I think I can count on one hand the number of times I've used the salt technique. It is one of the techniques you're going to want to explore when you do the texture studies. Um, table salt will work. 
uh, I found kosher salt or sea salt, being coarser grain, work a little bit better. But if you have a relatively dark area of pigment, um, and I thought maybe I'd have a salt texture on here. I don't. But if you have a darker area of pigment, then when it's not too wet, but still wet enough to soak into the salt, you sprinkle salt on. The salt absorbs the pigment, leaving kind of a it looks like frosted glass, a textured surface. And some artists use that extensively. So I supply a little bit of salt. You don't have to go out and buy any special salt for for this class. <clears throat> so we talked about tape, uh, talked about uh, devices to scratch into the surface with. Um, I've got a couple, three sponges here. These are natural sponges. Sometimes you're in a situation where a brush just won't cut it because it gives you too too rectilinear, too brushed looking. And sometimes you can get by, you know, with dabbing a surface. But a sponge works pretty well. And so you can paint, uh, think kind of shrubbery, where you need a textured, mottled surface, but it needs to look organic and natural. And you can pick those up. I keep several in the classroom, so don't run out and uh, pay big bucks for those. Hobby Lobby sells natural sponges. <clears throat> well, um, a very important item is going to be a container to put your water in. And any cup or glass will work. We keep a few around the building, but uh, Here's larger plastic containers. It's nice to have plastic, not glass, so they don't get broken. But uh, you're going to be constantly washing your brush, picking water up, uh, mixing paints with it. So you have to have a container to put your water in to store it or to a reservoir to, to, uh, to dip into. <coughs> um, erasers. Yes, you're going to need an eraser. Uh, this eraser for actually erasing the watercolor from the surface. A soft eraser. These soft white uh, Magic Rub erasers are nice for just erasing pencil lines where you don't want them. Uh, what do you draw with? Well, probably just an HB pencil. Uh, you don't want to put too much graphite on the paper because it's going to interfere with the final look of the painting. But it's okay to have some pencil lines. The drawing, evidence of the original, original drawing uh, staying on your paper after the paint dries. You won't necessarily want to erase those lines that do show up. Sometimes you do want to erase them. Um, well, that covers, I think, most of the items. Uh, need something to hold your brushes in. Uh, we talked about these the other day these containers to uh, wrap your brushes in. Um, you Be careful carrying brushes around in tubs because if the brushes get pushed up against the, the end of a tub when they're wet and they dry, you're going to have a bent brush. Uh, when you take the brushes out, kind of like that one's bent, uh, and or this one is bent, and it would take a, quite a while to work that bend out of the brush. So you want to avoid that happening. By the way, <clears throat> notice this brush has brushes on both ends. I created that so I wouldn't have to hold two brushes if I'm doing an area where I <clears throat> need to be moistening or using one color, but another color I can just flip this brush over and have two brushes in one. I need to make three or four more of those. That's been a handy little tool over the years. <clears throat> Uh, one more very important item, and I probably should not have saved this to last, but you are going to need some cotton rags. I usually run out to Walmart and buy a $10 package of diapers. These are diapers that have not, they're not pre-folded, <clears throat> yeah, diapers. Uh, some people still use cloth diapers, believe it or not. <clears throat> they're for sale in Walmart. Uh, this is actually a uh, cotton, um, it's over in the housewares, uh, white cotton 
dishcloth uh, sort of things. They're not napkins. They're, and again, they're about $10 for a package of 10. But uh, white cotton rags, not polyester cotton blend, but pure cotton. Uh, it's very absorbent. And you're going to use this for a lot of things. You're going to use it for dabbing, for wiping the surface. You're going to use it for helping control the amount of water in your brush. Uh, and you can get by with paper towels, but again, you're really handicapping yourself. I do a quite a bit of lifting out with these. <clears throat> Just paint and then lift out or blot to get highlights. So, um, some cotton rag like that, and I'll, I'll try to have enough here at the building so you don't have to go out and buy a $10 package of them. Well, um, probably some things that I haven't talked about that I could have, but those are going to be the major items that you're going to need uh, over the course of the semester. So the more of those you pick up, now the better. Yeah, there is one more. Put it over here. You don't have to have this, but it's nice to have an 18 by 24 inch uh, piece of masonite or plywood, but masonite's a little better size stiff backing because some days we're going to go outside and paint. In fact, in nice weather, we'll try to go outside and paint a lot just for social distancing. Uh, and if you do that, you're going to need a surface to hold your paper on, whether you're sitting on the ground or a stool or whatever, and uh, maybe a couple of clips to, to clip it to a board. So you might want to pick up an 18 by 24 piece of masonite. We do have some masonite that size that we keep here for painting students. And I think we can probably sell those to you. They're pretty cheap. Uh, and uh, there will be days that you will likely need that. Well, uh, lots of other things that I'm sure we'll talk about uh, in class. Things that I've forgotten to bring up now, but... Uh, that covers most of the paints and palette and cloth and water containers and other miscellaneous supplies. So go buy some stuff.